the Brain Over Belly podcast, solving the puzzle of obesity with Dr. David Brown of Idaho BMI. Today, we reconnect with Mona, our first of two special people who are eager to lose weight and keep it off for life with the help of Dr. Brown and Idaho BMI. It's been six weeks since Mona's bariatric surgery, and we're eager to hear how she's doing. You can also hear Mona every weekday on 1019 The Bull. Here's your host and Mona's co-worker, Rick Dunn. We're back, and today is a very special day because for the first time a few of us get together. We have Mona, who is our, I almost said first contestant, but <laughs> this yes, is a I am. Show. I'm ready to go, Rick. <laughs> you want you want to step on up to the wheel? <laughs> um, we have Mona in with us this morning, and uh, we also have Dr. Brown. So today it's all about figuring out that next level for Mona, what you've been going through, because. The bariatric surgery has already taken place. That was about six weeks ago. Correct. Well, first off, let me say hello, Mona. Hi, Rick. And hello, Dr. Brown. Hello. Good to be here. Very good to see both of you. Uh, you look great, by the way. Thank you. You look. I feel like your skin looks different than <laughs> uh, than before. Have you noticed anything like that since the surgery? No. I think it's hard for me to notice anything. You know, I'm... A down a total of 30 pounds, a little over 30 pounds, and uh, sometimes it's hard for me to see. I still right. see uh, the old me in the mirror, if that makes any sense. It's kind of like when you have a child, and as they're growing, everybody says, oh, they're getting so big. Oh, they are? <laughs> exactly. Okay, I get that. Yeah. So take us through this journey since you've had the surgery. What's it like? Where are we at? Well, <laughs> we're in a good spot right now. It seems um, in the beginning it was, I thought it would not be as difficult as it was, especially trying to get enough water down every day because your stomach is small, maybe two, three ounces. Is that correct, Dr. Brown? Yes. And it's hard to get 90 or what is it 64 ounces 64. of water down a day and i used to drink 96 over 100 ounces of water a day and that so was I no problem no problem so i'm thinking oh, i'm gonna breeze through this nope it <laughs> was pretty difficult <laughs> so that was that was a problem um remind me again with the water it's it, and, and that's not at meal time, right? That's just Correct. small doctor. That's like just little instances yep. throughout the day. That's Slow how that works. Slow and consistent throughout the day. Right. Yeah, little sips every two to three minutes. Do you struggle not drinking anything while you're eating a meal? I mean, I know you can, but the doctor has told us, hey, that's not necessarily a good thing. No, it's not a good thing. And a lot of people, uh, I've had friends that have gone through the same surgeries, and they, if they drink with a meal, they th immediately throw up. So I was warned not to do that. And it is difficult because I'm used to washing down my food with the, right. with the drink. So um, I've learned to not even set a drink on the table with me. So right. I'm not tempted to drink it. So tell us about some of the things that are different since the surgery as far as uh, things that were weird or things that you weren't expecting. What are those things and how is that? Well, um, I was, I'm not hungry and I guess that's, that's normal, but I wasn't expecting it. And I really don't even think about food. And then I was, uh, when I was on my liquid only diet portion for three weeks, I was thinking, oh, I should figure out what my first meal is going to be because that's exciting. I get to eat something real instead of just liquid. And um, what I'm finding out now that I in can eat real food is that nothing tastes the same. And what I thought I loved before the surgery doesn't necessarily taste that great to me anymore. Really? Yeah. I thought that was probably the most shocking. So what are some specifics when we're talking about foods that maybe you loved before? Um, now? Like... Uh, a chicken walnut salad I just thought was the bomb. Which sounds <laughs> actually pretty good for you. <laughs> right. And then when I, that's what I wanted to have for my first meal and I finally got it and it, it didn't taste that good. Throw this out. Yeah. It's like, uh, <laughs> Give no, me a drink this water. isn't working for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's, what yeah. about your sense of smell? Um, I haven't really noticed any difference there. You haven't? No, I haven't noticed any difference with my sense of smell. Well, sometimes doctor, that is an issue with people, isn't it? Yes, people become very sensitive to both tastes and smell and things they never noticed before become a little bit annoying or bothersome to them. And is it different for everybody, I would assume? Yeah, absolutely. Depending, and why is that? What's, what's going on there? Well, we all, have all got 
different genes, different backgrounds right. and perceptions of the world. And it's such a complicated thing. But generally, yeah, people notice differences that are subtle, but it's a pretty broad range of sensory signals that change. Right. So smell, not much of a change yeah, for you really there. I haven't noticed much of a change there. But what did click for me is Dr. Brown told me, you'll see food as fuel. And I did <laughs> because I can't eat a lot because of the two to three ounces that my stomach is now. So what I do put in there has to be important, like, right. you know, getting all your protein and and your green vegetables, things like that. So that's changed. And so I don't necessarily think about, ooh, what sounds good for dinner tonight? Uh-huh. I'm thinking about what can I get the most bang for my buck? <laughs> Real? Okay, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, so I'm like, oh, this is what he meant when he said, you look at food as fuel. So it literally, it kind of changes in front of your eyes. You, you're mm-hmm. you're going, okay, I don't think that's going, I'm going to be full in about three bites here. So that's not what I want to go with. I want to go with this instead. Correct. Do you ever look at like a big chocolate cupcake now? I know we're only six weeks into this, so it's not <laughs> like uh, God has come down from the heavens and, and cured you and saved you, but uh, what are the temptations that you have now versus the temptations that you had before bariatric surgery? Um, I think I think about wanting sweets, like say chocolate, right? But um, nothing; it doesn't taste good. It doesn't taste good. No, it doesn't taste good to me anymore. So I don't have it. So you've tried that, and the taste is different yeah, than I, it used to be. I I guess, I guess it's just not as satisfying. Uh huh. So it's. It's and not, you're not getting that, oh, this is so good. Does that moment. happen with everybody then, doctor? Just about everybody, and at least temporarily. So on the back end of things, that taste or maybe even that temptation might come back? It depends on what people do. Um, you know, in the previous podcast, we talked about all those sensory signals, and really the key after surgery is knowing what's going on, what those signals mean, and really mastering the ability of listening to those signals. If a person isn't given what I consider the right tools or they don't listen to those signals, they go away. How much do you eat at one time? I know that's a very forward question. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm not going to ask you how much you weigh unless you... Well, thank you. I appreciate that because I, I heard you oh, asking oh, um, oh. the other gentleman how much he weighs. I did. How much did. he plans to lose. And I'm like, I can't believe he said that. Oh, was but, that bad of me to say? <laughs> no, I think guys do numbers. Women don't. Yeah. You know? But yeah. anyway, the I eat maybe... It's hard, not very much at all, like maybe a fourth of what I would normally eat. Wow. So it's, I mean, you're eating maybe this much. Right. Can anybody see that? (laughs) No. Oh, yeah. Nobody can see that. So she put her hands together in a little circle, and that's not very much. So maybe, I don't know, how much much would you say? Three ounces, maybe? A day? No, at a meal. At a meal. And I maybe have two meals a day. Right. So I know eventually we want to get her to one meal a day. Is that correct, doctor? Or that's um, that's. I think for most people that's reasonable. Um, again, we don't want to set our sights too narrowly on any specific thing, but it, most people will get to a point where they eat once a day. At this point, almost always six weeks or so after surgery, where certain reminders become very important, and that is to really rely on those signals to determine portion size. Now, we've been trained our whole lives to think in terms of calories or the weight of a food or even visually looking at a portion size and saying, oh, that's about right. What I always do with people at this point is sort of remind them, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's natural to think that way, you know, measures that are outside of us. The key is really relying on those signals in the body to help us determine the healthy portion size. I've even, and I am not going through the journey that you're going through, but I've I've noticed that I, just talking to you, doctor, have started listening to my body a little bit more. Now, I eat a lot more than I should probably, um, but I notice that when I'm full, I stop eating, and when I'm hungry, I start eating. Is, have am, you lost the weight? 
Have I lost? I think I have lost a couple. You do look I look like, like I do? Mm-hmm. Look, I'm doing what you're doing, Mona. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's what I was going to say was that um, I am trying to pay attention to what I'm eating. And even just the simple thing of putting your fork down and chewing your food, counting your bites or your chews for up to 20, 30 times, and then waiting a minute to take the next bite really gives you time to think about if you want the next bite. Are you satisfied? Are you full? What I have learned in this process is that if I eat too much, even one bite too much, I feel uh, of like a pressure, like a, like a burp that's stuck right type of a pressure and uh and it's uncomfortable so i don't want to feel that way so i don't eat that bite so you bring up the chewing which mm-hmm. is part of the whole process dr brown has talked about that before how important that is yeah. why explain again why do we have to chew every bite 30 times and then wait an entire minute after that until we take another bite so it's actually the number you get to when you're counting as you chew really isn't important Okay. And it's not about the texture of the food. The counting as we bite or as we chew, that is activating a very specific part of the brain. For the geeks out there, it is the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Actually, it's the frontal polar cortex, but it's a very specific part of the brain. You can think of it as the ultimate command center. And that center of the brain is connected to other parts of the brain through these networks and circuitry. And the bottom line is activating that center is very important. And both counting as we chew and the timing of the break between bites, those are executive functions that are activating this center in the brain. And the other principle is, as Mona has talked about, listening to those signals from the body. It's crazy complicated, but the bottom line is we are calming or decreasing activity in some areas of the brain and stimulating activity in other parts of the brain. Um, And then you throw memory in there. There are different types of memory, episodic memory, working memory. These are neurological things. We never think about it, but they're actually very critical in appetite, in portion control. If, as is so often... We will rush through a meal and eat very quickly. Right. We're not thinking about what we're doing. And when we do that, uh, we don't discriminate what we eat as well, but we don't remember the episode of eating very well. And that influences appetite and hunger pains just within two or three hours later. Interesting. So um, the idea after surgery is the brain is in this condition of being very malleable, and so we want to repeat these things as consistently as possible. And the end result is that becomes the new preset or the default in the brain, and it becomes very easy to do. So there's been a lot of work so far that you put in here, Mona. You, uh, before the bariatric surgery, you had to go through a process, and then obviously the surgery itself, and as you're coming out of that, you're six weeks in, uh, you're eating smaller portion sizes. Food looks different to you. Uh, you don't crave some of the things that you craved before. How's your energy level? Tell us a little bit about that. Um, I feel great, and my energy levels, I would say, are definitely up. And as I've uh, told Dr. Brown before when we visited, is that I feel present, where I'm like uh, awake with my eyes wide open, seeing and feeling what's going on around me. And it's amazing. I absolutely love how I feel. It's interesting to me that the intake is so much less, and yet the energy is there. Can you explain that, doctor? Yeah, that is something that shocks almost everybody. Even two or three weeks after surgery, they've been on a liquid diet, so they haven't eaten anything. Yet their energy level is much higher than what they're used to. And what we explain is that Really, the cause of that is the body transitioning into using fat as the primary fuel instead of sugar. And fat is a cleaner fuel. Interesting. And so when you're burning fat, you have this mental clarity and you have more energy. There's a lot of things in the body, different systems that are actually optimized when you're burning fat for fuel. So I have clean fuel. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) 
You look like you have clean fuel. I'm not sure what a person is supposed to look like when they have clean fuel, but I'm pretty sure you're it. Yeah. You're the poster child. Uh, I love having Mona in here because she can mess around with me. Um, this has been uh, quite the journey so far. Tell us more about what you're going through. Uh, pain, sleep, some of these types of things, or anything that comes to mind. Well, I um, have less pain. I don't have as many aches and pains as I did before, and I don't have creaky knees and stuff like that. Um, My sleep, sometimes uh, I sleep all night, and sometimes I'm up two or three times a night. So I don't think that necessarily has anything to do with my diet. I just think it's shutting off my brain and not thinking. So you've had sleep issues for a long time though, right? Right. And you've had to do different things through the years to try to help yourself sleep just a bit better. Mm -hmm. Is this normal, doctor, with people that are going through the surgery or after the surgery? What is the norm? Well, sleep disturbances are very common in people who struggle with weight. And I often say to people that sleep is more important than exercise on this journey. And that's another thing that's very shocking to people. Um, If a person stays up at night, whether they're working on radio or whatever it is, if they're up at night, uh, that increases appetite the next day and it alters hormone levels in, in pretty specific ways that promote weight gain and appetite and stress and anxiety. But it's very common, and it's something that we focus on a lot after surgery, the different things that we can do to optimize sleep, because there's some pretty great information out there on how to do just that. So is your weight loss so far, and we're not really judging things based on how much people are losing at what point in time, are we, doctor? So I did clinic earlier today, Uh and I didn't look at one person's weight. Oh, that's cool. In clinic. It's just, it's, yes. It's It's not important. Um, it's not that it doesn't matter. It's just, it's not the most important thing. And if we focus our attention on these principles and becoming consistent, everything else really falls into place. And so honestly, it's not what I naturally think about when I see people. I'm not going to ask that question then. I'm going to ask a different one. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) When it comes to eating, Mm -hmm. is it about for people that are thinking, Hey, this really, maybe this will work for me, or maybe I, I love seeing somebody move forward and things are working, where's this going to go right now in this journey? Is it about willpower or do you uh, think it's about something else? Um, I don't think it's about willpower. For me, after the surgery, I think it's about getting enough water down, getting enough sleep, and getting making sure you're getting enough protein For the day. I guess with the keto diet, it's mainly the proteins and the healthy fats that are helping you burn the fat for fuel instead of the sugars. So that's the important part. What else are you going through that we're missing here? What what is it like to live in Mona's body right now? (laughs) We know what it was like to live in Mona's body before we brought you in and you were getting ready for the surgery. And it was even fun then, us kind of uh, romanticizing about what's it going to be like on the other side. Well, we're on the other side of that surgery. And then now we're uh, thinking about what's it going to be like in 18 months because that's how long this process is. What is it like to be Mona right now? Well, I'm excited because I have more energy, which makes me want to get out and do more things. Like I will, um, since the weather has been so bad, I gone to the stores and I walk around the perimeter of the inside of the stores and then I go shopping. Really? So, yeah. So like say I go to your neighborhood Fred Meyer and I'll walk around the Fred Meyer. That's you. And then, I... Yeah, that's me. <laughs> that's me walking around, bumping you with my cart. You're in my track. Yeah, that's me. I love and you. so and then once I get my rounds in, then I'll shop for whatever I'm there for, get our groceries and go. And I always have, uh, I never have a problem finding a parking spot because I try to park the farthest out. So I get some extra steps in that way. That's very cool. Just little things like that. But it's like what I've noticed when I wake up, I first wake up and I'm kind of groggy. But once I'm up and out of bed, man, I am on it. And it's, it's definitely a different feeling where before I'd feel tired and groggy, probably most of the day, maybe not until after lunch before I'd pick up a little bit. But now it's like, right as I jump out of bed, I'm ready to go for the day. 
because I used to look at people thinking, how do they do that? What's wrong with that I'm person? I'm obviously not a morning person, but <laughs> I'm becoming one. <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah. Boy, those are some amazing changes. And all of that, I would assume, doctor, uh, is pretty normal when you're going through this process. Yes, very common. And one of the first things people comment on is the decrease in pain. And a lot of people assume it's a result of weight loss. And that's part of it, but it's just as much about the decrease in inflammation in a person's body. So knees, hips, lower back. People very often say that that's improved pretty quickly. And it's not because of the weight loss, really. It's the decreasing inflammation. What else is important for people to hear? We're six weeks in here. This is a place we've never been before since we started the podcast. Uh, it's a place that we've talked about. What do you think is important for people to hear about where Mona is and about the procedure and where we're at in general? So, again, I would emphasize the point that bariatric surgery works primarily because of its impact on a person's brain and central nervous system. And it really gives us this golden window of time where we can do a lot of things. And on the matter of sleep, uh, a lot of leading scientists would tell you that the primary role of sleep is two different things. One is what's called pruning. Think of pruning a tree or something in the yard. Every day we have experiences, you know, walking through a doorway, talking, all kinds of experiences. And one of the things that's ha that happens in sleep is pruning those unnecessary, unimportant details from memory. On the other hand, uh, especially if we're interested in reformatting the brain or learning new things or developing new habits, uh, there's a process called consolidation that happens in sleep. So while we sleep, the brain is sort of cementing into place those things, hopefully, that we want to learn or those new circuits in the brain that we're trying to develop. What I love about this process is that it's not just about getting on a scale or working out or even eating right. It's about retraining your brain. And that's the exciting. I mean, there's science behind this entire thing here. And that's, I think that's something special that people want to hear about, don't you? Absolutely. And again, when I see people in clinic and we start talking about this for the first time, they haven't heard these types of things before. They're shocked, but they feel a sense of hope in that it's something different, and it, it sort of clicks with a lot of people. It makes sense to them. Because most people have felt that way, I think, most of their lives. I know, Mona, you you battled with this and tried, I don't even know how many things you tried. Everything. Yeah. Every diet out there. And so finally you found the answer. What um, I have noticed is I've mentioned before that I've had some friends that have gone through this surgery before. And a lot have been even, say, 10 years ago that have gone through it. What I love about Dr. Brown is the fact that he gives you information that helps you after the surgery so you can lead a healthy life and make better choices for yourself and not be fat or obese, whatever word I should use there. Whatever the politically correct yeah. word <laughs> yeah. is. So Nobody I knows be. anymore. Right. So I can, you know, cure my obesity. And that's what I'm after. And that's what I like is having. I'm somebody who needs the information. I need more information. Kind of like that movie with Johnny Five. I need more information. So if I, with Dr. Brown, I get the information in which to uh, make better life choices for myself. Do people come in, doctor, asking to go through a process that will just allow them to eat whatever they want? Well, I think people, again, it's, it's a natural result of what we've been told and taught for so many years and decades, and that is that it's just a, mount, a matter of decreasing how much you eat. Eat less, move more. And that is such a ridiculous uh, simplification of the problem. Um, I operated on a woman about a year ago. And she gave me permission to, to, tell to the relay story. the story. Okay. So she had had a gastric bypass in California about 10 years ago. And about six months after that operation, she was doing great. She, was, she had lost a lot of weight and she felt very good. Well, about six months after that operation, uh, she thought to herself, hey, I, I feel like eating some of the old foods. The, the foods are the things that gave her sort of that buzz. Uh, it was Dr. Pepper and M&M's. And she said that the first time she consumed those things, they tasted terrible and they made her sick. But for whatever 
reasons, emotional or whatever reasons, she continued and she continued to consume those things and it didn't take long for those things to take on their former characteristics of really? tasting good and giving her that buzz. Hmm. So I saw her 10 years after that operation because she had we regained the weight. And so we did a revision operation with the idea being that that gives us potentially the opportunity to push that reset button on all the sensory signaling again. So Mona's been experiencing a lot of changes. What's causing that? Is it the surgery? Is it uh, her mindset? Is it her body? What is it? Great question. Um, and there's been a lot of research done on this. So for this operation, we are essentially removing 80% of the stomach. We're stapling across the stomach. And in doing so, we are also stapling across tiny little branches of what's called the vagus nerve. That is a very important nerve. And for whatever reason, stapling across those tiny branches of that nerve sort of resets the communication between the brain and the intestinal tract. A lot of people have heard of the gut-brain connection. Hmm. Uh, those two things are intimately connected and are constantly communicating with each other and influencing, even controlling each other. Well, by changing the anatomy in the intestinal tract this way, it alters that communication almost instantly uh, through nerves and hormones. There's several hormones, uh, important hormones like insulin, leptin, ghrelin, GLP-1. There's a lot of them. They are altered pretty dramatic, dramatically within 24 hours of the operation. And it's, this has been looked at. It's not a change. Of course, it's not a, a result of weight loss. Um, really, everything points to a matter of neurology. In other words, communication through nerves. The operation is generating that type of reset through uh, those nerves and indirectly through those hormones. Mona, we wanted to uh, give you the last word because you're the guest of honor here today, of course. So uh, anything? You, you, you've got fans now. So, well, you've always well, had isn't fans. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> um, <laughs> it can be. <laughs> well, I'm just excited for my journey ahead and where I can go from here because I feel I have been given the tools in which to solve the puzzle of obesity. And I'm excited to finish that puzzle. Dr. Brown, thank you so much again for coming in here. Wonderful to be here. Mona, thank you for coming in, and we can't wait to have you back in. This has been great, and God bless both of you guys. Keep it up, okay? You bet. Thanks, Thanks Rick. Rick. Thanks, Mona. You bet. <laughs>